It is indeed a pleasure for me to announce that this year's New Cardiovascular Horizons Award recipient is Dr. Mark Woolley. Dr. Woolley has served as an inspiration to countless physicians in the interventional field. He trained at the Mayo Clinic and then went on an NIH fellowship to Sweden where he learned new catheter skills. So Dr. Woolley was one of the true pioneers in angiography in the United States. But in addition to that, he was a pioneer in terms of medical development. Uh, of course, we all know of the Woolley wire, which is used in peripheral um, interventions. But Dr. Woolley also gave us the power injector and founded the company MedRad, which has now grown to be a, a large medical device company. Dr. Woolley brought angioplasty in its earliest stages, doing some of the first work in a saphenous vein bypass grafts. His work in the carotid system has been legendary. He has helped to develop uh, the very first purely uh, carotid-based uh, stent uh, with the company Endotech. His list of accomplishments are great, but you know there's a lot more to Mark Woolley than that. His energy, his passion, his willingness to teach, his advocacy, all of these things set him apart from the masses. He is truly a hero. To be a pioneer, one must constantly look forward, never back. One's attention must be focused on the possibility of tomorrow, its needs, its opportunities. All great inventors share this trait. And this year's new Cardiovascular Horizons Lifetime Achievement honoree, Dr. Mark Woolley, is no different. He's an interventional radiologist who's recognized internationally for his contributions to the endovascular field, both through his inventions and his continuing leadership. As a small boy, Mark learned firsthand the importance of hard work by helping out with his father's business. I was born in, uh, in McKees Rocks, which is a suburb of uh, Pittsburgh, and spent most of my life there. My family was in business, actually been in business now for 100 years, and my dad uh, was a retailer, so we had three or four retail stores in the Pittsburgh area. But when my brother came out of the service, he closed the retail stores and decided to go into one concentrated fish business, so they opened up fish, but they were like any cyclical business, we were either had money or no money. <laughs> so my brother grew up with a family when they had money, but I, I grew up with it was a down cycle. Woolley's fish market would become famous, but its success had very little to do with Mark. I wasn't bad, but I wasn't great. So I don't think the family was ever too impressed with me in terms of the business. I don't think I was really cut out for it, but I've never lost my business interests. I didn't think I was bad with the customers, but my dad didn't think I was good. So, I forget, there's several episodes, he said, you know, you, you are not nice to the customers, and you might think about another profession. <laughs> so my mother says, okay, dad doesn't like it, be something else. So I started thinking about medicine as a profession. My cousin was an ophthalmologist, and he encouraged it. Mark attended the University of Pittsburgh and then received his medical degree from Hahnemann University in Philadelphia. My basic training was primarily uh, when I finished medical school, internship, and I spent a year at Case Western Reserve, and I spent that year in radiology. And I really wasn't very happy in radiology in that first year because it was mostly, quite frankly, a lot of uh, non-communication with the patient. And uh, I left radiology and I was going to go back to medicine or surgery. So I had about three or four months off and I decided, okay, I'll return to radiology, but I went to the Mayo Clinic and that changed my whole attitude to radiology. I was really quite satisfied with radiology at the Mayo Clinic, great environment, superb environment, easy to publish, easy to write, all kinds of assistance. And I finished the Mayo Clinic and uh, at that time, angiography was just beginning, it was very inception. 
with Seldinger Technique. And that was going on in Sweden at the time. The stars aligned, and Mark was fortunate to land a two-year NIH fellowship in Lund, Sweden. The time there would change the course of his career. I must say that uh, I think that time in Sweden really changed my whole outlook on medicine and radiology. It was overwhelming, just absolutely overwhelming. They were doing procedures that we had no idea were going on in this country. Because in this country, the clinicians were so good, they really didn't need sophisticated imaging. But in Sweden, it was just the opposite. They were anatomists, and they were huge on anatomy. But I was never really happy in just interpreting films. I mean, there was no responsibility with a patient, not a lot of communication with the doctors, and I just had to have more clinical activity, so really, that's when I went essentially full-time into interventional radiology, which also was just inception at that time. When I finished in Sweden, I was all set to go to the University of Washington in Seattle. It came December, time to come home, and we hadn't heard from them yet, and I thought everything was established, but the contract wasn't signed yet. So I thought, I better check to see if we really have a job. So I called the chairman there in Seattle, and he said, well, we're gonna call you. The neuroradiologist has decided to stay, so we don't have an opening. And I said, well, what about in Seattle? Any other openings there? He said. Well, I'll look around, but I, I'm doubtful. Seattle's loss would be Pittsburgh's gain. University Hospital in Sweden offered for Mark to stay, but he knew it was time to return home. Living in his parents' basement with a wife and two small kids, Pittsburgh, in hindsight, would be the perfect place for Mark's career to flourish. He eventually landed a job with a local VA hospital. There, he built a vascular program and then shortly after, returned to the University of Pittsburgh, where his life's work would truly begin. The, the vascular programs in those days was in its infancy. It was, a, it was a kind of phenomenon just to puncture the femoral artery and perform an aortogram or a renal arteriogram, because in those days, we were doing the neuro carotid, from direct carotid puncture. It was fluoroscopic monitoring. You were looking in, into a fluoroscope, it was not a TV monitor. So this is very early days, so you're looking at, so you were working on the patient, but you were looking in the fluoroscope and, and while you're manipulating the catheter. And for, in, the, in pediatrics, we knew actually where the vertebral artery was, so we did a lot of procedures without any fluoroscopy. In those days, it was pure diagnostics. The fact that we could puncture an artery percutaneously without an incision was an accomplishment. That was Seldinger's technique. So when we came back from Sweden, we introduced angiography in Pittsburgh. And then subsequently, intervention was then introduced. And then we became involved and said, look, it's possible now that we can treat these vessels with a non-invasive method with conventional balloons by opening up a blocked artery with a balloon. So the whole balloon technology evolved in that early era. And we started doing angioplasty on blood vessels. Dr. Woolley was one of the pioneers in interventional radiology, but what would come next would take his contributions to a whole other level. One of the real advantages of being in Pittsburgh was the association that I had with CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. And I've worked with those engineers from electrical engineering to mechanical to bioengineering for now 30, 35 years. And uh, when I came back from Sweden, the, the angiographic injectors, where you inject the dye to visualize the heart or visualize the organs of the body, uh, we were using at that time a primitive pump where you stood on the table and you pulled down on the handle to inject the dye. And then that subsequently was replaced by a, a Gidland injector, which utilized CO2 injection and nitrogen. And it was a huge, huge machine just to inject a small amount of dye in the patient. So when I was in Pittsburgh, I ran into a primary care physician. And uh, he said, what can we build? So I said, I'm gonna give him an idea. So I said, look, his name was Steve Heilman. I said, Steve, we can build an angiographic injector because there's nothing on the market. And we'll build a little portable one that you can put beside the patient. And you press the handle, we'll inject the dye, and we'll see everything because that's what's needed. So I thought, 
you'll forget about that. Nothing will ever happen. So I go back next time because we were doing some radiology for him. And he had all these physics books out and engineering books out. And I said, so this guy is serious about building this injector. So he was very serious. So we built the first angiographic injector, really functioning flow-controlled angiographic injector. Years of work, switching from hydraulic to electric motor, the Mark Series flow rate control system was ready for use. Unable to find a manufacturer, Woolley and Heilman eventually decided to form their own company. Today, MedRad and its injector are still the gold standard. However, the injector's first human use did manage to leave an indelible impression on MedRad's first employee. In those days, we didn't have the regulatory issues. If we were dependent on the FDA approval, there'd never be a MedRad injector. We would have never had it. Because in those days, physicians used their own good judgment. So we injected the first patient under flow rate injection. And Rudy Kranis with these engineers standing. When we injected the dye, because contrast media in those days was uh, not, not, it was ionic, and it caused pain, the patient screamed so loud and sat up on the table that Rudy, the engineer, thought the patient died. <laughs> he thought we killed the patient. <laughs> that was the first MedRat injection. But see, I knew that contrast media was irritating. And just that it went in a, with injection with one confined bolus, it was that's shocking. But obviously contrast media now is non-ionic. It doesn't have nearly the problem. But that was the first MedRat injection. It was scary. The injector opened the floodgates of invention within Woolley. Idea after idea soon came pouring out, the next one being the Woolley wire. After the MedRed injector, which was a major accomplishment, uh, we, I subsequently then developed a wire we called the Woolley wire. And it was designed so that it would be controllable and steerable because in those days we didn't have that. So CMU, Carnegie Mellon Engineers, and myself, we developed Woolley wire, which was the first steerable, controllable 035 wire. Well, the first wires that we were using were nothing more than guitar strings. So they had no directional control, and they were also excessively rigid at the tip. So they would dissect the artery, it would tear the artery. And I can remember not being able to get into the circumflex, and the circumflex was as big as my thumb. So that just couldn't get into it, there was no control. Now it's a simple procedure with a controllable wire. The wave of creativity continued with the Gemini balloon. Aortic stent graft designs, carotid stents and balloons, a filter wire for carotid distal protection, and most recently, the super stent. Mark's talents have gone beyond the art of invention, however. He has been a respected voice in the international endovascular community. Most noticeably, he has been a champion of carotid stenting. The history of uh, inter interventions for carotid artery occlusive disease goes back to in the early days where we were simply dilating carotids in patients who had no surgical options. And I can remember dilating an elderly lady who didn't have a surgical option, dilating with a small three millimeter balloon just to show that we could open the vessel up and had her come back and it had him actually remodeled, looked even better than that. And I showed that first balloon case years ago. And that stimulated some interest. So there's a group, Ted Dietrich, uh, Bob Ferguson, Gary Rubin, Marty Leon. A group became interested in the carotid as an access site for non-invasive intervention. So the early days of nitinol stenting, when we really thought we could stent everyone like they do the coronary, was probably a serious mistake that we made. And so the early trials were designed around stenting everyone, regardless of age. Patient selection was not a criteria. If you had stenosis, we thought we could dilate it. So the results in the early stages were not what we anticipated and weren't as good as surgery. And we came out under a lot of criticism from one, operator experience and poor patient selection. Now that's been corrected. Now, for example, the CREST trial is a landmark trial established that carotid stenting with experienced operator 
and right patient selection is the equivalent of surgery. It is now the equivalent of surgery. I could retire to device development. Yeah, I could do that. Could I give up clinical practice? I think I could, because I've done thousands of cases. Device development and the creative uh, development involved in devices is, is fascinating. Uh, is it easier today than those days? Absolutely not. It is expensive today, unreasonably expensive. One, I think entrepreneurship will always exist because innovation is a contribution. So I think that will always exist. It's just a lot more difficult. Always looking forward, always seeing possibility. That is the spirit of a pioneer, of an inventor, and this year's honoree. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2011 New Cardiovascular Horizons Lifetime Achievement Award recipient, Dr. Mark Woolley.